Welcome to Financial Planning Explained. I'm your host, Mike Menninger, Certified Financial Planner, owner and founder of Menninger & Associates Financial Planning. Uh, I'm pleased to have Nick DeVito, one of my associates, also a CFP, uh, joining us for a case study today. Thanks for joining me, Nick. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, we've been a, it's been a while since we've done case studies. Yeah. Um, I think the last few episodes we were doing uh, were Social Security, and then we had year-end tax planning, and then we had a few other things going on, but you know, backed by popular demand, oh, yeah. uh, a lot of people like the case studies. And you know, one of the things that we're finding is that uh, the number of views and stuff like that, and people stay in tuned. Hey, you know what? I'm trying to be able to bring to the viewers what they like to see. Uh, again, the, the whole intent of this show is to provide educational content and for the viewers to hopefully uh, trigger, and that's what's great about the um, uh, doing the case studies, because it kind of triggers thoughts. It gives us sort of a a reason to talk about a lot of different things yep. and you know change the names change the facts but it just kind of lays stuff out uh you know adding stuff deleting stuff just for the sense of creating content if you will because you know some things may apply yeah some things may not but yeah, if, mean, if you do enough of these you're yeah. gonna catch I mean, obviously everything we talk about today is not going to apply to every individual but if you can grab a few things here or there we're talking about social security or taxes right. or it's really applies in that and, and that's what we try to do we always try to grab uh, and these are real life case studies mm -hmm. you know we, obviously we change the names and we change uh, some of the information but it's solely because of the fact that if you asked me to come up with an episode to do <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, here we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about uh, Jack and Charlotte today. Um, it's really touched upon a whole lot of the areas of, of financial planning and the six areas of financial planning, cash management, tax planning, risk management, which is insurance planning, investment planning, retirement planning, and estate planning. We did touch upon estate planning. They've got wills. They have an estate plan in place. Uh, there really wasn't much to talk about as it pertains to the insurance planning, but we definitely picked up four of the other six. Mm -hmm. um, and as we all know, tax planning is always involved. Yeah. You know, no matter what you do, there's a tax impact. Yeah, and I think what's also really beneficial with the case studies is it, is it kind of lets people get in between our ears and see how we think about things right. and how we process information. What do we look for when we first meet with someone? What are the areas, what are the stones we like to unturn? So I think right. it really is beneficial from that standpoint as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And we uncover a lot of stones. Mm -hmm. So uh, Nick, since you pulled a lot of yeah. this stuff together, why don't you start laying out sort of some of the facts. We're going to overwhelm you a little bit, yeah. but what we're going to do is going to kind of lay out the facts mm -hmm. And then as we're talking about different subjects, we're going to pull the facts back in to reintroduce them. Yep. All right. Yeah, so uh, Jack and Charlotte. So Jack is 60, Charlotte is 65. They are business owners. They actually own a franchise. Um, Jack has a $65,000 salary, and this year they're about estimating a $20,000 business profit, and they have three independent adult children, so not on the payroll anymore at this point. Yeah. So the other thing that I would point out is in both cases, they retired. Yes. Okay. They retired or were laid off, downsized, what have you. They were both in corporate America mm -hmm. and doing very well. Yeah. Um, but this franchise opportunity opened up for them a couple of years ago. Uh, they like what they're doing and it was a way of getting out of corporate America mm -hmm. and, you know, doing the business ownership. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so they came to us and one of the first things we do in any meeting we have is say, what are you here for? What can we help you with? What are you looking to accomplish? So for them, they wanted to maximize their tax efficiency, improve their investment allocation. The current contract they're in with the franchise um, is, is over in five years, so looking to retire in that time frame. Determine whether or not to take Social Security. When should they take it? Who should start first? Right. What age? Um, which pension options? They have a couple pensions lurking out there, and they say, what should we do? Should we take lump sum? Should we take the monthly? What do we do with these pensions? And they have some debt out there, and it's primarily in the form of mortgages and then their home equity line of credit, which we'll right. touch on a little bit later. Right. And again, we're going to be touching upon each of these in greater detail, but yeah. these are just some of the goals. So keep going. Mm -hmm. So in terms of their assets, they have about $30,000 sitting in cash about a million in investment accounts. Um, they have a million dollar home and they have about a $450,000 vacation home. And then that debt we were talking about, so on their primary residence, they have a $210,000 mortgage that's sitting at 4.75% interest on that. A Their mortgage on their vacation home is 200,000 at 
3.625%, and they have a HELOC lurking out there for 200, or sorry, 100,000 at 7.65%. Right, and so to, to just to touch upon that, mm -hmm. obviously they took out these mortgages a few years ago. Yep. Um, now, the four and three quarters could have been a refi or at the front end or of the, where things started going up again, yep. but certainly the vacation property being the three and five eighths, mm -hmm. that's a pretty cheap deal. Yep. But the line of credit, because interest rates went up, when you hear the Fed raising interest rates, that directly impacts immediately the home equity line of credit rates. Yeah. The difference between a variable rate and a fixed rate. Yep. And the home equity line of credit is a great tool that we have a lot of our clients utilize. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we have them take it out to put to use it, but just having it available to them. We say, look, go out there, get the highest limit you possibly can. Right. And it's like a credit card. If you're if there's not a balance on it, you're not paying interest on it. So it really provides flexibility in a financial plan because you have access to liquidity if you need it. Right. And what it also does is it takes pressure off of having money in savings mm -hmm. as an emergency reserve. Yep. And especially if people are looking to retire, we say, let's try to get that HELOC before you retire. Because right. if you retire, you don't have the income, you might not be able to get that loan or right. that line of credit. I exactly. Exactly. Um, in terms of retirement assets, they uh, Jack has about $500,000 in an IRA. Charlotte has about a million. Um, Charlotte also has an inherited IRA for 20000 and then in terms of their pensions, Jack has uh, his pension, the lump sum value is 180000 Charlotte has two pensions, one's 15000 for the lump sum and one's 38000 the And so, you know, we talk about a lot of times the lump sum versus the uh, district, you know, just taking the regular yeah. pension. And when you get the lump sum, I don't remember what the exact numbers were, but if I see a $15,000 lump sum, you know what that's telling me? About 100 bucks a month. Yeah. Is 100 bucks a month going to make a difference? Highly yeah. unlikely. I would say general rule of thumb, you might be able to speak to this a little better. It's about 0.4 to point, or sorry, 0.4 to 0.5 of a percent is right. about what that monthly number is. Right. And you're looking at the lump sum versus the monthly distribution, just kind of a general rule of thumb right. from what I've seen. Um, so yeah, it's is it worth it to have that? We'll touch a little bit more yeah, on that later. Yeah, exactly, exactly. From their investment accounts, um, they have various investment accounts out there. Once again, it's about a million dollars in investment accounts, and they do have around five hundred and sixty thousand dollars in long-term, mostly long-term capital gains. Not all long-term, but five hundred sixty thousand dollars right. in gains. And we, one of the first things we noticed when we looked at those statements, we said, "Oh my gosh, you have forty-five percent of your investment account is in one stock." Right. Generally, you want to be diversified. I said generally, you want to be diversified, and you have a lot of exposure to one stock. Well, what happens if that one stock goes down? It's oh, it take, takes you down with it. Down with and it. so it's also not uncommon to see because it was his the stock in his company. Yeah. You know, so he was doing the employee stock purchase program. Mm -hmm. He was given options, RSUs. The next thing you know, before you know it, you're accumulating stock in your company. Now, mind you, he doesn't work for that company anymore. And the stock has appreciated all these years. Yep, and now all of a sudden, you're sitting on a half a million dollars worth of stock mm -hmm. with very low cost basis. Yep. And then not only that, that's the one stock that he had 45% of his account was in. They had another stock that was 10% of their account. Right. So if you look at it, 55% of their total investment, their just their non-qualified investments was in, one, in two stocks. Right. So that can lead to some issues and you want to try to be a little bit more diverse. But it's done well to this point, but you never know. Something could come out in the news. All it takes is one bad news cycle. That's and, correct. And your company and, and it's happened many, many times for many different companies. Um, and it could have nothing to do with the market as a whole. And it may not even be legit. I always like to refer back, I think it was in 2002. This is at the time of Sarbanes-Oxley and you know when they were having all the accounting shenanigans going on. And you know the uh, IBM was questioned by the IRS as to their accounting, mm -hmm. and the stock dropped like fifteen or twenty percent in the span of a couple of days. Not but one week later, the IRS said, "Oh, we're sorry, you're clear." Yep. Uh, they just got smoked fifteen to twenty percent, and it never came back. Yep. And at least not around. Yeah. That not. Time. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So anything can happen to you know, and then you even take a look at you know in the news today. I mean, look what's happened to the bellwether of the Dow was Boeing, which was 12% of the Dow. Well, you know, it had its issues mm -hmm. with one, you know, you can't say the market, a, anything can happen to a particular yeah. stock. Enron, it's a bad example mm -hmm. because that was so much falsified yeah. garbage. But the long, GE, you know, mm -hmm. GE, the darling of the 80s, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, 
you know, went from like 60 to under five. Yeah. And I mean, for his case, he's not working there anymore. So it's a little bit different from a diversification standpoint. But oftentimes we'll have people come to us that are still working for that company. Right. And then they're almost triple leveraged in it where their income is based on that company. They have a bunch of stock options that are based on that company. They might have a pension that's based on that company. So when bonuses, you, bonuses, all this stuff is tied up in one company. You really don't want to have that much exposure to Absolutely. one single company, especially if it's the company you're working for. That's correct. General rule of thumb, 5 to 10% of your yeah. total net worth in, in an individual stock or an individual company is okay. Yeah. But you just want to be careful, especially if you're still working for that. Well, company. here's what we also find a lot of times is someone who's been with a company for a really long time tends to drink the Kool-Aid. Oh, yeah. Oh, this company is the greatest company since mm-hmm. the development of the person who developed sliced bread. Right. <laughs> okay. And it's like, you know, stock only goes up and everything else like that. And then, you know, they're drinking the Kool-Aid. Or, or sometimes you'll even see they get caught up kind of in the past where maybe there was a nice 10 to 15 year run where it was doing really well. Right. It was outperforming the market. When you look at it over the past decade, it's like the market, and it's okay. You're, you're kind of hanging on. We ran the into that. Right? That's no, what I was just, that's what made you think about it. Yep, that's exactly. right. Somebody, that's right. And we even brought it up, and we said, you know, in the last ten years, it's only been up twenty percent, not annualized twenty. Twenty percent. He goes, yeah, I know. Yeah. And that that one that individual was even much more exposed to his company stock. His whole four hundred one k was. In the company <laughs> I know stock. the entire one. Yeah, so oh my goodness, I know. We run into that sometimes with just. Like I said, general from 5%, 10% of your net worth in an individual holding, not bad. If you're working there, you just got to be careful. So what really jumped out at me when I looked at them is the fact that they got a million dollars in IRA assets and a million dollars in non-qualified assets. They have no Roth, mm-hmm. okay? Um, and we'll talk about it later, but I know one of the things that people at that age, the first thing that comes to mind is they want to retire yeah, you know, will I have enough? Yeah, and and I think we were able to demonstrate that mm-hmm. without much of a problem. So therefore, we're trying to always develop strategies and ideas to help them accomplish their goals and objectives, but at the same time to make sure that the federal government isn't one of their primary beneficiaries. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yep. Um, so kind of jump back into the investments. We always like to take a look at people's overall investment allocation. For the case of them, their aggregate, they're about 50-50. 50% stocks, and I say 50. 50% cash. 50% cash. I remember that. And not bonds. So we brought that up to him and said, are you aware of the fact that almost all of your IRAs are in cash? Yeah. And they didn't realize, mm-hmm. and this is a, a very important component, they rolled over their 401k mm-hmm. into an IRA. And what, by rule, a 401k has to come out as cash, except if you're dealing with a net unrealized appreciation, yeah. which you're not talking about. It's not the story. And for however many years, that money was sitting in cash, you know? And it, it was kind of out of sight, out of mind. They weren't, they didn't need it at the time, so it was just sitting. And I don't know, I don't really remember exactly what happened. I don't know if they just assumed, you know what, I was invested in my company. Right. When I rolled it out, it stays in those investments, but we got it. They we had said, no idea. Do you know that 100%, it was a Jack's IRA. I said, do you know that 100% of your IRA is sitting in cash? He's, I didn't know that. Right. So the, and Same with Charlie. And that's, and, and that's missed opportunity. When you're oh, it's hugely missed opportunity. And, I mean... And, and they don't even know how it's been years yeah. that it's been sitting in cash. Mm-hmm. It's been a good few years yeah. that it's been sitting in cash. I mean, heck, if you take a look at what the markets have done, just you know, just over the last few years, mm-hmm. they could have easily made 20%, 30% on their money. Yep, and that is not a small yeah. number. Absolutely, absolutely. And, I mean, conversely, their non-qualified account was 100% stocks. So it did balance out from that standpoint, but even if you're 50-50 and it's all cash, you know, you have some opportunity with bonds as well for some Of course. So we really like to look at the overall picture. And while the overall picture doesn't necessarily seem as bad, when you realize one account is sitting in 100% cash and it has been for a number of years, that can be a problem. Well, so what also jumped out at me is that you got the Grim Reaper hanging around. That's called Mr. IRS, mm-hmm. okay? Because I see the fact that all of their assets are tied into two entities. Their 401ks or IRAs, which are pre-taxed, they're gonna get taxed on, and they got all these capital gains. And then when we looked at their tax return, well, that's that's coming that's up. That's got to be that's, coming up. That's next. right now. So we took a look at their tax return. Just so just so everyone knows, one of the first things we do in that intro meeting 
is we, we say, okay, bring in all your stuff, let us take a look at it. And the two things I would say you could arguably learn the most from, pay stub, tax return. That's correct. Gives you a great picture of what they have going for them. If, you, if it's a pay stub, you can see, you get their income, you get how much they're withholding for taxes. Are they participating in employer programs? The 401k, how much are they contributing to the 401k? Do they have an ESPP, RSUs? You can learn a lot from a pay stub, but you also learn a lot from a tax return. Oh, absolutely. And so we took a look at their 2023 tax return. They had eighty thousand dollars in jaw dropping. Yes, eighty thousand dollars in W two income, fifteen thousand in qualified dividends, about ten thousand in capital gains, and then they had the business loss of a hundred thousand dollars. So they had adjusted gross income of five thousand dollars. When you take out their standard deduction, we realize they had a taxable income of zero dollars. Actually, the taxable income on the tax return shows zero because tax returns don't show negative for taxable income. In reality, they had negative $23,000 of taxable income. And I've come across this before and people are cheering, woo, I don't have to pay yeah. taxes. Let me tell you something, huge missed opportunity. I don't know which was the bigger missed opportunity, that tax return or the fact that they had 100% of their IRA in cash. Yeah. You know, I mean, the thing is, is that when I looked at this, I was like, you got to be kidding me. Because at the very least, they could have taken $23,000 of income and paid still no tax. Right, zero. That's before they even get into the 10 and 12% tax bracket, right. which is an, almost a no-brainer. You want to utilize that when you Absolutely. have um, over a million and a half dollars sitting in IRAs that's going to be taxed so at some point. We could have taken about $115,000 out of an IRA and moved it into a Roth and paid $10,000 in tax. Or they have a boatload of capital That's right. gains sitting there. $115,000 of long-term capital gains. We would have paid my favorite tax rate, big goose egg. Yep. And so unfortunately, it was lost opportunity yeah. because we saw this after the fact. And yeah, I was disappointed that the CPA didn't pick that up, but yeah. you know, I'm not going to pick on the, first of all, I, I'm a big fan of the CPAs. I think they're worth their weight in gold. However, what happens a lot of times is they're in the process of doing all their work yeah. and they're just churning mm -hmm. tax returns out and not really looking at planning opportunities. And to be fair, what you'll oftentimes see when someone's getting their taxes done is they don't want to owe any money. Right. If you, if, if you tell a client as a CPA, you're getting a refund or you don't owe any tax, woohoo. Right. They're not looking at it, the client, some, depending on the client, the level of sophistication. They're mainly looking at, do I have to pay? Am I getting money back or is, do I owe nothing? Right. And they're not necessarily doing that long-term planning and that's where we really come in and, and look ahead and say, okay, well, this was missed opportunity. What can we do to- Right, and it's this? water under the bridge. And you know, there's nothing we can do about the past, but what it did is it set us up um, talking to the client to have a meeting with us in the CPA, which is what we did. And you know, to the, to the CPA's defense is the CPA does not necessarily know what they got over here. Oh yeah. All the CPA is doing is doing their business tax return. Mm -hmm. They're doing the business tax return, taking the uh, data from that, transcribing it onto their uh, 1040, their personal tax return, and saying, here you go. They're, yeah, they're, they're not, not planning. They're not planning, and they're also, like you said, they're not creating a balance sheet for them. They're saying, oh, well, how much do you have in your non-qualified accounts? How much do you have in your Right, they're not you doing Roth it. They're not, that's not really their job. That's not their purview. That's what we do. That's, that's what we do. They do. Which is also why it's really good to put us oh, yeah. with the CPA Absolutely. together. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a break here, um, and then what we'll do is we'll start getting into some of the strategies, planning, and things like that that were associated with this. So stay tuned. We'll be back with you in just a few moments. Do you keep up regularly with your investments? Where exactly are your hard-earned dollars going? Are you financially prepared for an emergency? I'm Mike Manager, founder of Manager & Associates Financial Planning. We believe that education and knowledge are powerful, and we want our clients to understand why we are making the recommendations that we make. It's your money, and you deserve to know where it's going, because it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. So call us today to discuss your financial concerns. Welcome back to Financial Planning Explained. I'm your host, Mike Manager, Certified Financial Planner, and I'm here with Nick DeVito, also a CFP. Um, as we continue this case study, we talked about um, how they had, you know, we gave all the base facts, but the last thing we talked about was a huge missed opportunity mm -hmm. where they filed their taxes 
the prior year and had minus $23,000 in taxable income, which was an absolute missed opportunity for the two things that we look at. They have a million dollars in pre-tax assets and they got a million dollars in stock with $500,000 in gains. Those are the two things we're trying to unwind and we missed last year's I would opportunity. I say especially with the capital gains, because of the fact that you could have wiped out hundred and some uh, thousand dollars in capital gains and if you really wanted to bought the stock right back and you just reset your cost right oh yeah we've done that before exactly i know we've done that before without even getting into diversification you could have just reset a hundred and fifteen thousand dollars worth of gain or however much it was right gains and if you can keep the same stock if you want there's no loss show rolling a gain yeah i mean it is what it is um you know you just got to move forward but it, it just demonstrates the added value of having both a CFP and a CPA on your team. Yeah. Because we look at taxes. I mean, you know, trust me, the CPAs know way more than what we know as it pertains to taxes, but we don't need to know all of the stuff that they know. You know, if you look at the big pie of taxes, we have this one little wedge that's associated with financial planning, but boy, do we really take it to a level much deeper. And so put us together with the CPA Tell you what, we're just viewing the same thing from two different lenses, and it really helps the yeah. client out a lot. Let me tell you, if you get with a good CPA, once as you said, they're worth their weight in gold, but they also appreciate the communication between them. Oh, absolutely. The CPA doesn't love to get that when they're filing taxes. You did a Roth conversion, why don't you talk to me about it? Or you didn't let me know. It's always best for ourselves, it's best for the CPA, it's best for the client when everyone's communicating. And well, so we learned that yesterday. We had a CPA yeah. in here who didn't even wasn't even really aware of Irma, mm-hmm. you know, which is the Medicare premium tax. Yeah. Uh, tax. I call it. I call it a tax. So you know, a lot of what we deal with every day that the accountants don't, and a lot of what they deal with every day we don't. But when we're dealing with the clients, put the two of us together, it is absolutely, absolutely. the client wins every time. Yep. So, <clears throat> yeah. So okay. Yeah. So one of the big things they wanted to talk about was was their debt. So they have those mortgages lurking out there. They have the home equity line of credit. They said, what should we do about this? And to us, it was kind of a no-brainer. They have all this money in an investment account. Let's get rid of that HELOC. It was a hundred thousand dollar HELOC. Yeah, it's seven and seven five eighths yeah. or whatever the heck it yeah. was, seven and three quarters, uh, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we said we'll start off by paying that down. They didn't want to have any debt at all. So we were we were kind of weighing: do we pay down both mortgages? Do we pay down one of the mortgages? So what we ended up doing with them was having them pay down their HELOC pay off their primary residence mortgage as right. highest interest rate. And we said the vacation home. I know you don't love having debt lurking out there. But it's 3.63. Right. Well, the other thing, too, is that, you know, there's two components of it. Number one, it's a drag on cash flow. Mm -hmm. You got a $100,000 line of credit, even if you're paying interest only, let's say at 8%, you know, it's $8,000 a year. It's costing you 670 bucks a month just having to make those payments. Okay. That's number one. It just feels good to get rid of it. The mortgage, I don't remember what their mortgage payment was, but it was certainly probably another couple thousand yeah. dollars. A well, month. they had two mortgage payments too, so it was. But the problem is, is that where do we get the money from? Mm-hmm. Well, we get the money from either the IRA, which I'm not taking three hundred thousand dollars out of an IRA to pay down yeah. a mortgage because guess what? You're going to get crucified in taxes. Yeah, and especially if the interest rate on the mortgage is relatively low. Correct. So, and, and that's one thing we, we have this conversation with clients relatively often where they come in, they, maybe they have the cash flow to be overpaying their mortgage, or maybe they have the cash to just straight up pay off their mortgage. But then they'll come in with these two and three interest rates on their mortgage. Right. And that's where we have to say, and that's why there is two components to it. There's the dollars and cents, and then there's the psychological. Like Correct. I said, to Mike's point, the psychological aspect of, I don't like owing people money. So right. if I cannot owe someone money and not have to pay interest, I don't want to do that. But then there's the dollars and cents that's saying, well, I mean, as of a few months ago, you could be getting 5% sitting in a risk-free money market. Right. So you're taking money out of something earning 5% to pay something at 2 and 3 eighths percent. Does it really make dollars and cents? And Well, the good news is that we, we come to the table with uh, an advantage that we have over all of our clients. And, you know, people say, well, it's because you know more. Not really. Yeah, maybe maybe we do. Okay, but the one thing for certain is... We don't have the same emotional attachment. Absolutely. And so we've, you know, one of our, our, our new motto or mission statement or whatever you want to call it, tagline or slogan or whatever, is we help clients make well-informed decisions. And we do that by teaching them. And if they were ready to take 
all this money out of an IRA to pay off a mortgage, we would lay out the cost of them doing that. Mm -hmm. Or if they wanted to sell their stock, we would lay out the cost of doing that. And so what we did in this particular instance is we took a look at it and we weighed the advantages and disadvantages and we were able to meet somewhere in the middle yeah. because we were able to sell some stock and, and we were able to do some finagling that it wasn't too impactful from yeah. a tax perspective, but it also helped them take two of the three debts off their shoulders. Yeah, and it, we accomplished multiple goals. We were tax, we were tax efficient. We cleared out some of the capital gains. We were able to di essentially diversify a little bit because we were able to sell off some of that high concentrated stock and use that to pay down some of the capital. Correct. Some of the mortgages. So it was really a three-pronged approach that we took and, and it was really beneficial for a variety of reasons. Right. So what I see happen in here is we're going to be talking about a lot of the tax planning um, and we're going to then talk about the investment allocation we're going to talk about the retirement planning, retirement planning strategies. You know, maybe we could just touch briefly on the tax planning strategies at this time because we're wrapping up on this episode. And then what we can do is we can pick up on part two of this episode and get into more of the tax planning strategies and the investment and the retirement planning strategies. So, you know, I, again, on yeah. the surface, you know, we had to, for tax planning, last year was water under the bridge. Yep, nothing we can do. Nothing we can do. So now what we're trying to do is we're trying to project out what is their income going to be this year, but just one year. Tax planning is not something you do for just one year. It's looking into the future, not to mention that you know this year being 2024 happens to be the second to last year under the current Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, yeah. which is the, the Trump tax code, which is the lowest income tax bracket structure we've ever been in, it's going away in two years. So we're also trying to capitalize and maximize on that. Yeah. So I think this is a good breaking point. So what we're going to do is we're going to come back with part two in the episode, kind of pick up a little bit on these facts, refresh, and we'll see you next time. Is there anything that you wanted to add before we jump? No, I mean, just kind of to go off what you were saying about the tax brackets changing in a couple of years. If you're not familiar with that, we actually did an episode on that. We did a few episodes on that. The one on year-end tax planning, and then we did some on the tax law changes that are coming up. So if you aren't really privy to them and you want to check those out, they're up there for you. Well, and the irony of it is that we talk about it in every episode. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a daily discussion yeah. because guess what? It's staring us in the face. Mm -hmm. So anyway, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we will be with you uh, next week, and I hope you learned something, and I hope you can pick this up uh, next week where we finish up this uh, episode. So thank you again for joining. Have a wonderful week. Bye.